God is good. And all the time. Come on, y'all. We in the gym right now. You know, when you in the gym and you ready to work out, you know, you get, you should be excited about that. God is good. And all the time. Psalms 40. I'm going to read 1 through 5. The Bible says this. I wanted expectantly. I waited expectantly for the Lord. And he took notice of me and heard my cry. He plucked me out of the pit of confusion. Even out of the quicksand, he plucked my feet. He placed my feet on a rock and established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will watch and be in awe. And they will place their trust in the Lord. How blessed is it that strong person who places his trust in the Lord and who has not acknowledged the proud nor resorted to the lies. Lord, my God, you have done great and marvelous works and your thoughts towards us. There is no one who compares to you. I will recite your actions, even though there are too many to number. Psalms 40, 1 through 5. Welcome to Agape, where the love of God is experienced. That's a bold statement, isn't it? Because you have to show somebody love that they can experience what it looks like. To our visitors today, if we have any, welcome to Agape. And my prayer to you all today is that you all experience the love of God that you all do not leave out of the presence of God without knowing that you are loved by God. Before we get started today, I had some Q&A questions that some individuals asked that I want to answer before we get into the word of God, if that's okay. That's all right. It, I always tell people, ask questions. You know, when I was a kid, I was taught, don't question God. But now I question God about everything. And I believe us as believers of God, we should invite people to ask questions about God so that they can have an understanding of who he truly is. Here's the first question. Somebody asked this question. They said, in the Bible, where it says God made man in his own image, both male and female, could it be that God was made in both images? This is a good question question is on the board as well. Do you know that there's a Queen James Bible? There's a Queen James Bible. The LGBT community used this text to promote that God is both man and female. But I want to answer this person's question today with the Bible because the text answers itself. It says in Genesis 1:27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he who, him, male and female, he created he, them. I want to add a, a, a text to that question to answer this individual's question. First, let's identify who God is. The Bible says, let us make man in our image. So let's, let's see what image God is made in. The Bible says in John 4, verse 24, the Bible says, God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Worship him. Identify him more. Didn't say her. Said him. So we are identifying that God is a man. Number two, let's look at Christ, the son. The Bible says that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He walked with us. The son of God, Christ himself, the man, he's a man. He didn't come, he, Mary didn't birth another woman. She birthed a man. 
Thirdly, the Holy Spirit. He, the Spirit of truth, will guide and lead you into all truth, convicting you of sin and of unrighteousness and of judgment. He, the Spirit of truth. It didn't say a woman. <laughs> Instead of man. <laughs> God created man in his own image after his likeness. He breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Could God be both male and female? The question to that answer, the answer to that question is no. God is a man. He's not a woman. He birthed man, created man, and the woman was born from man. That's why she has the W-O, because Adam named her Eve because she came from man. <laughs> she came from man. Woman, <laughs> as Adam has said. Here's the question number two. They said in the Bible, th the Bible says things that I want to do, I don't do them. But the things I want to do, I find myself not doing. Please explain this Bible text. Romans 7, 4, 14 through 24, talks about Paul, where he stated in his prior life as Saul, things that I wanted to do, I found myself not doing them because I hadn't been converted yet. That was Saul. But I want to answer that, that text with verse number 4 of the same chapter of Romans 7. The Bible says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye would be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. To the individual who is struggling with this text to use it as an excuse to continue in sin, because I'm quite sure that's what the text was referring to, it, there are things that I want to do that I find myself not doing. I'm having a hard time doing that. Listen to what Paul says in his converted state. He says, wherefore, my brethren, ye are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Listen to what Paul is illustrating here in his changed status. A status of one who is free from bondage of sin, but who has become married to Christ. Saul wasn't married to Christ. Paul was. <laughs> so now Paul is, is I, I, I want to answer this also with this. You have three individuals that Paul is talking about in this text. The husband, the wife, and the law. Which two do you think died? husband can die, the wife can die, but the law cannot be destroyed. By no means necessary. Paul answers the question. He says, I died to sin, to be married to Christ. Christ says the only way out of sin is divorce. Because when you were sinning against God, you were fornicating. So the only exception out of a marriage is divorce. So I divorced Satan. And I got married to Christ. <laughs> I pray that this answers the individual question. If you have any other questions, I, me as men's ministry leader, I want to get us a questionnaire box in the back where you can just ask a question, drop it in the box, and you can get your answers. Or we can do a study on Zoom at any time. Can you all stand for the reading of God? Get your all's Bibles open. We're going to go to Malachi chapter 1. What book did I say? Chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Malachi chapter 1. Verses 1 through 9. When you get there, say amen. And the Bible says this, The burden of the Lord, of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say what? Wherein hast thou loved us? Was Esau, was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? 
yet I love Jacob. Verse number three, I hated Esau and laid his mountains as the heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom says, Where are we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build and I will throw them down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Why would God have so much indignation forever towards somebody? Verse number five, and your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified for the border of Israel. Verse six, a son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. And ye say, where have I despised your name? Verse number seven, ye polluted the bread upon my altar, and ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, the Lord table, the Lord, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind sacrifice, is this not evil? And if ye offer the lame and the sick, is this not evil? Offer it unto the governor. Offer it to your boy, uh, who's our president? Biden. <laughs> Will he not accept it? Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse number nine, and we're going to, you all can be seated. And now I pray, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This has been by your means. We will regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts. Let us pray, family. Father in heaven. I pray now, Lord, that you would choke my carnal nature. Don't allow it to breathe, Father. Don't allow my own opinion to hold any weight because you have to be lifted up and glorified, that you would draw all unto yourself. Hide me behind the cross, Father. Cover me with your blood. Go before me now. And may your angels that excel in great strength influence the mind of my brothers and sisters that they will see you in a way that they've never seen you before. Speak now, Father, in Jesus' name. You all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Malachi opens up with something that's very, that was very profound to me. He said, the burden of the word of the Lord was given to me to take to Israel. Why would Malachi use the word as a burden of the Lord? to be handed to him. And I had to, and I was talking to God and I said, Lord, why is the word so heavy? Why was Malachi, why was this a heavy burden for him to take to his own people? You see, the load, the load of Malachi that he had to carry was so heavy that this thing, after his death, was a weight of about 400 years of space until Christ came on the scene. Think of how heavy that had to be to where no other prophet can be raised be after me because this thing was going to take 400 years before these individuals would see a deliverer. But then I started to rationalize and talk to God about this, and I'm like, Lord, this thing is even heavy with us who are called agapites. Because if it wasn't, we would be spreading this thing like wow. But it's so heavy and intense that sometimes we get stuck. Notice, I'm going to give you a little history of Malachi. It says, by the Babylonian captivity, the Israelites were effectually cured of the worship of graven images. And after their return, they, they gave much attention to religious instruction and to study of that which would have been written in the book of the law and of the prophets concerning worship of the true and living God. You see, the restoration of the temple enabled them to carry fully the ritual services of the sanctuary. 
I titled this message, and our subject for the day is called Temple Ready. How many of us are temple ready? It was guys like Malachi that was temple ready. Listen to some brothers that helped this brother out. It was leadership that Malachi was under of guys as Zerubbabel, Azariah, Nehemiah. You all familiar with those names? Zerubbabel, what did he do? He, he built the temple, right? Nehemiah and Ezra, what did they help do? They helped build the temple, right? They repeatedly covenanted in their hearts to keep all the commandments and the ordinances of Jehovah, but the season of prosperity that followed gave them ample evidence that God's willingness to accept and forgive, and yet Israel somehow in some way fall back with short-sightedness. They turned again and again from their glorious destiny back to, to a selfish, appropriate, and abated mind that they themselves, which were brought healing and spiritual power, they lacked it back. God would have brought prosper, temporal prosperity and, and spiritual power to his people had they not gone back to worshiping idol gods. Think about the idols that we worship today. And think about why our temporal prosperity is lacking. Why are we lacking temporal prosperity, Agapite? Because this failure to fulfill the divine purpose was very apparent in Malachi's day as it is sternly in our day to day. And God had to deal with the evils that were robbing us from those temporal prosperities in our spiritual lives. What are our temporal prosperities? Let's look at the Bible. 3 John 1 and 2. The Bible says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest what? Prosper. And be in what? Health. Even as thy what? Thy soul prosper. Why are we lacking temporal prosperity? Could it be we are rejecting the right arm of the gospel, the health message? We haven't been taking consideration into those wholesome foods that God has asked us to partake in that can give us that extra edge. Or could it be that those guys, the Rebbebel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, were, were, were much effective even in their temporal prosperity to, uh, to uh, give them more strength in their spiritual prosperity because they had learned how to fast and pray while building the temple of God? When's the last time you fasted and prayed? Like, be honest with yourself. You know, in building the temple of God, sometimes when you're building the temple, it's empty. There's nothing in it. God told David, hey, let them make me a sanctuary that I might what? Dwell amongst them. Paul put it this way in Romans 7, 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. There's something inside of us in this temple that has to be ready and prepared to meet God when he comes. And my question today to you all who are Godbites, are you temple ready? You see, this word of Malachi, it had dwelled in him so richly, so heavy, that it became a burden of preaching to them again. Because they turned away from God. I want to take you to an individual who was a pioneer of our Adventist church. Her name is Sojourner Truth. This is what can help our souls prosper. Sojourner Truth. She, she, she had a taskmaster, and, her, and she noticed that her taskmaster prayed two and three times a day. And she watched him for a time as he did this, and she came to herself one day, and she asked him, why did he do this so often? And her taskmaster said to Sojourner Truth, whose name is Elizabeth, uh, Isabella, he said, it got me closer to God. 
So, so Sojourner Truth said, you know what? If he can do this two and three times a day, I'm going to take it to the next level. I'm going to do it three and three. She said about time she got through fasting and praying, after she would eat her first meal, she would have so much energy that she can go to and fro in the streets spreading the word of God. As a personal trainer, I always tell my, my, my friends that I work with intermittent fasting. Why is this important? Because while you're going throughout your daily activities, start eating your meals early in the morning. Early in the morning. Give yourself at least seven to eight hours, maybe ten hours, so that everything through the temple can process the right way. And I guarantee you, while you're intermittent fasting throughout your day, you will be able to receive the voice of God more clearer than ever before. I guarantee you. Matter of fact, I'll go an extent further. Sundown Sabbath, go at the edges of the Sabbath, start your fast in. And don't eat until after you receive the word of God in his house. Then go eat. And watch how you will eat and you will be like, man, I wasn't even really hungry. I know what the power of God can do because I've witnessed what the power of God can do through fasting. Our temporal prosperity comes through fasting, but we gain that spiritual prosperity for the soul because now we're more in tune with God. Malachi had an understanding of this. Sojourner Truth, an Adventist pioneer, had an understanding of this. Matter of fact, she couldn't go to a court system and free her son from the white man had she not been fasting and praying. The first woman to do such. She got in the name Sojourner Truth because she went to and fro, freeing her people. You can't think about food when you got another individual that's on your heart that you're praying about. Because you're feeding off the word of God. You're, you're depending on God to do something that's out of this world. How many of us are so sincere about our temples being ready to receive God that we can go through a season of fasting and praying to see somebody come out of sin? That's how heavy this word is. It was a burden for, for, for Malachi to take this back to his people. Notice, in his rebuke against the transgression, the prophet, he spared neither priest nor people. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi was a lesson of the past to never be forgotten. And that covenant made with Jehovah with the house of Israel to, was to be kept with fidelity. Only heartfelt repentance could be the blessing of God and be realized. We talked about that this morning in, in, in Sabbath school. A heartfelt repentance. David said, wash me, but don't just wash me, cleanse me. Don't just cleanse me, blot it out. Get it out of me. Notice how verse 2 goes in. He says, I loved you, saith the Lord. And ye say, where have you, where have you loved me, God? What have you done for me that I can't do for myself? I, I had a coworker. He said, man, I, I, I come to work. I clock God ain't help me with nothing. I said, to a certain degree, that's true. You Sometimes you got to let people talk. Let them express themselves. And as he was talking, I said, to a certain degree, you're right. God won't do for you what you can do for yourself. Because he's giving you all the faculties to operate how he created you to operate. If you want to go get a job, you can do that. Matter of fact, God goes to the extent to give an extra invitation. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. So with that option, he's saying, hey, you can do as you please. You got the power of choice. I've given that to you. So in a degree, to a certain degree, the individual is right. But to go to an extent further, you can't stop the heart from beating. The air that you breathe is different from the spirit of God that dwells in you. So even though I've given you the ability to do what you can do for yourself outside of me, I've still given you the breath of life to even do that very thing. And you have the audacity to say, wherein have you loved me? He 
said, was not Esau Jacob's brother, said the Lord of hosts? I hated Esau. Why would God put this in the Bible like that? Think of this, Sharp. I hated Brother Sharp. <laughs> like, just put your name in the text. Like, I hated Michael. Like, you, that would have me aroused. Almost to the, to the point I had to write a Psalm 51 like David. Lord, why do you hate me so much? You ever ask God that? Lord, do you hate me? What did Esau do that God hated? Let's go to Genesis 25. Let's look at this. Go with me to Genesis 25. When you get there, say amen. We're going to start at verses 29. And the Bible says, and verse 29. And Jacob saw a pottage, and Esau came from the field and was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called what? Edom. And Jacob said, sell me this day your birthright. Esau, and Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. What profit this birthright? could do to me. And Jacob said, swear, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage and lentils, and he did eat and drink, and he rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. God hates an individual who will stand before him, get baptized, sign their name on a certificate, read all of the 28 fundamentals and go through all of the vows in front of a congregation of individuals as well as their family just to turn around and take the same baptismal paper and give it back to the church. That's sacred to God. You made a vow with God. That's a covenant with God. When you, when you got baptized in Christ that day, you made, a, you made a decree before God and man that these are the things that you were going to do. You made a promise with God. Then to come and take the same birth certificate, the birthright, and say, there you go, God. I got something else better out there. I'm, I'm getting faint. Can't do this no more. Put it to you in this sense. How dare Christ said I, this temple I tear down in what three days? And what would he do? He would rebuild it, right? He was talking about what? His body. In order to be temple ready, temple ready, God has allowed us to have these vessels that He bought back with a price. He bought us back with a price. How dare we take the body of God and trade it in for something because we start to begin faint? Oh, Lord, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm just wasn't feeling it today. This is what pleases me the most. I'm going to do that instead. God, like, hold on. <laughs> for this? Notice what his brother did. His brother got up and walked away. Because his brother valued the sacred things of God. How, va how valuable are our bodies, our temples today? In order to be temple ready, we got to have a vessel that is sacred unto God. Our bodies are sacred. Paul said the deeds that are done in the body, you're going to be judged for those things. Your body was bought back with a price. So what you do to it, you're going to pay for it in the judgment. Esau, you Edomites. He said, I'm going to lay your Matter of fact, these Edomites were so wicked. This is what they said. They said, man, we're going to take the city and we're going to rebuild it, even though God said he's going to destroy it. We're going to rebuild it. 
I'm going to take this same temple. I'm going to do whatever I want to do with it, even though God said he's going to destroy it. That's how wicked Esau's descendants were because of the decision that he made. When you take that which is sacred that belongs to God and you and you and you soothe yourself for something that you want so much because you feel that there's no other solution at that moment of time. At that point of time, you just traded your body in to be in the hands of the enemy. Go with me to Hebrews 12. I'm going to show you what God referred to Esau at. Hebrews 12, 16. Listen to what he says about Esau. It says, let there be what? Any what? Hebrews 12, 16. Least there be what? Any fornicator or profane person as who? Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. God said this brother was a fornicator. He was profane. The day he did that, he, he committed fornication against God. How dare I take the temple of God, commit spiritual fornication against God, and then expect God to use me as a holy vessel? That's not the case. Malachi says no. Solemnly, evildoers were warned of the day of judgment to come as Jehovah's purpose to visit with swift destruction. Every transgressor, yet none were left without hope. Malachi's prophecy of judgment were accompanied by invitations from God to the impenitent to make their peace with God because God said, return to me and I will return to you. God said, Malachi 3, 7, return to me, and I will return to you. But it seems as if every heart must respond to such an invitation. The God of heaven is pleading with his erring children to return to him that they may again cooperate with him in carrying forward the work in the earth's history today. The Lord holds out his hand. To take his hand, agape, and to help them to the narrow path of self-denial and self-sacrifice to share with him in the heirship of his son, to be sons and daughters of God. But here's a question that God is concerned about. Will they be entreated? Will they discern their only hope? How sad the record in Malachi's day. The Israelites hesitated to yield because of proud hearts. So in, in, in God's response, here's his response. Will a man rob God? The Lord reveals to his people one of their special sins. Will a man rob God? But if you go back to verse 2, you can ask yourself, you can say, well, Lord, where have you loved me? <laughs> you said you loved me, didn't you? Will a man rob God? Well, let's go down the list, family. This is how you know if you're not robbing God or not, the Ten Commandments. If we didn't have 1844, if we didn't have a sanctuary message, if we didn't have none of Ellen White writings, if we didn't have all of this other stuff that we have as Adventists, one of the greatest things that we have to prove and show to the world is God's moral standard outside of everything else. An individual, I don't have to prove God to any man. The only thing that I can show the man is what the law has done as, as, as me, an individual, looking into the law of liberty, me seeing the reflection of a transcript of his character, Will a man rob God? The Bible says in the first commandment, God spake all these things, saying, I am the Lord thy God which brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other God before me. And you ask, where, where have I loved you? I brought you out of Egypt. 
I brought you out of the house of bondage. It compels me that an individual would get sick and go to the hospital, then start praying and asking God. But this is the mercy of God. He still gets him off the bed. He walks them right back into the same situation. They, get, they pray to God when they're in critical condition. In God's mercy, he still delivers. Individual get locked up, man. I, Lord, get me out of here. I, I messed up, God. He said, I brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I'm the one that freed you out of those situations. It was me and me alone. God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not worship any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven or above, that is in the earth, in the earth beneath, that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God. I am a jealous God. Catch a brother talking to my wife. Guess what? I'm going to feel some type of way. I'm jealous. God gave her to me. Not you. What are you doing? You know the law requires death. <laughs> what are you doing, brother? Bag up. COVID, six feet. Guess what? The same things that pertain to God pertain to us. <laughs> right? We are his people. If he's jealous about marriage because he's the one that made it, then why shouldn't I? She don't belong to you. He's not yours. <laughs> don't use the Lord as thy God's name in vain. Esau, how dare you say I'm getting faint because I'm out in the field and I'm doing all this work. Hey, man, can, that food you're making, can I get it? When there's, when there's food in your father's house, if you'd have just waited on the Lord. Even the prodigal son understood this. He, he was among swine and husk. And the Bible says, as he was eating, he began, it came to his mind. He said, hold on, I sit here in this pit of sin, eating with the pigs of swine and husk. Is there not enough bread in my father's house? Esau could have learned from that brother. But self-gratification wants what it wants right then on the spot. Be careful how you trade the holy vessel of God in for something that's only temporary. Be careful. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days work and labor, but the seven days are the Sabbath of the Lord's God. When is the last time you actually shut your whole temple down so that God can come into the body? You know the Sabbath is the best time to do that. Stop eating sunset. Let your organs rest. Let the whole body rest. I guarantee you, healing will start to come over your body. Christ did most of his healing on the Sabbath. Are you anticipating a healing from God? Stop eating. And start eating the bread of life. They sung the song today. Shut your whole body down. Or let the whole body rest. So often I hear people, I'm tired, man. What are you tired of? As if you did something so extraordinary outside of what God has already provided you to do. You tired? Malachi 1, 6, it says, A son honoreth his father, a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? If I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest who despise my name. Ye say, wherein have we despised your name? You despise my name when that thing that you wanted the most, you traded your body in for. You defile my name. How dare we say, I'm a child of God. I'm representing Jesus Christ. And the name is coinciding with the word. But I'm going to take the name, use the name, but not live up to the name of the individual who has the name. He said, where have you despised my name? The way you walk. Your body language speaks that. 
you know, the law is spiritual. There's no way around God, bro. Where have you despised my name? Have you been amongst individuals at work and yet to speak my name to these individuals so they can know that I am the true and living God? What are you using your temple for? Are you temple ready? God wants people who are temple ready. He wants to dwell in our temples, y'all. He said a son, a son honors his father. If I'm his son, then I'm going to honor my father. If you're his daughter, you're going to honor your dad. You know the Lord's Prayer breaks segregation? I told a white guy this at work. He said, what do you mean? I said, the first thing to this thing that's honoring our father is to say our father. It's no discrimination. <laughs> Christ started off eradicating racism right out the gate. Our father. Let's eliminate that right out the gate. He your dad just as well as he's mine. No color vision over here, brother. The blood was shed for you too. He said, you offer polluted bread in my altar. And ye say, wherein have we polluted you, Lord? And that, and that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. It's like a preacher getting up here in God's holy place and giving you something that's just totally fabricated. But living totally contrary to the word of God itself. You know, when, the man, when, the, when, when Malachi said, when the man, will a man rob God? He's asking a very interesting question about sin across the whole globe. That one statement is inclusive of all of the Ten Commandments. Will a man rob God? You know where that text originates from? Do you all know? Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. Let's go there. Look at this. Look at this. Will a man rob God? Genesis 7, 11. Say amen when you get there. What does that say? In the 600 what? Year of Noah's life. In the second month, on the 17th day of the month, the same day were what? All the foundation of the deep what? Broken up and the windows of heaven were then opened. How many individuals defiled God's name at that time? What was Noah? He was in the altar. The ark. Listen. Here, here, here's, here's case and scenario. You can get some money in the mail. You can say, well, man, this is a blessing from God. That's not a blessing. That, was just, that just came because of your obedience to take care of what you was doing because you were obedient to God. The blessing is this. is when I take the gospel and use it in transforming my own character that others may see my character and be influenced by. It says the very hammer that Noah used was a witness to individuals. God poured out so many blessings that the world couldn't even receive it because they died in them. He wiped them out. The only individuals who received the blessings are the individuals who died in Christ and entered into the ark. So weigh the balances on the blessings. Are these blessings are from God or... Are, Am I amazed about what God is doing or am I focused on being so temple ready that even if these things are happening, I know it only comes by being obedient to God. Noah prepared a house, a temple that was ready. And he saved his whole household. They was temple ready. They even invited animals in there. <laughs> he had giraffe, monkey, kangaroo, birds. I'm quite sure a whale came up to him and gave him a hand fire by pushing water out of his out of his back. Like, thanks, Noah. We get to go into the new world to experience the full blessing that God has for us. How many of us are temple ready? 
You see, we may each charge upon ourselves what here is changed upon the priest, but our relationship to God as our father and our master strongly ob obligates us to fear him with honor. But these Edomites were so, were so scornful that they derided reproof. Sinners, they ruined themselves by thriftily to battle in their own convictions. They battled, they battled in their own conviction. Oh, man, I'm good. I'm all right. Talked about the publican and the sinner this morning, man. I don't, I, I pray, I fast three times a day, Lord. I don't do what Brother Sharp do. <laughs> I ain't gossiping on such and such, such and such. She wearing her sh skirt all the way down. I don't do that, Lord. You come into church and you only praying to yourself. You're not even praying to God. This is, how, this is the condition of the Edomites. Those that lived in careless neglect of holy ordinances who attain on them without reverence and go from them under no concern in, 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 in any effective way. They say that the Lord is contemptible. This is acceptable, God. We can do this all day. I go to church, pray, and then I just leave and get back to what a business as usual. Holy people do holy things. Tithe is holy. Marriage is holy. The Sabbath is holy. God says, be ye holy as I am holy. That's the temple, y'all. Be ye holy as he is holy. Are there not any holy people still living today? Where's the holiness of God? So often you come into the house of God, phones are going off, conversation is being said, people are eating junk food, I mean all type of crazy stuff. And you're like, hold on, is God not to be reverenced? Is God to be placed on common man's ground? As if he's not holy? I wish gravity was down here to keep me on my face before the Father, as angels do in heaven. I would prefer to just praise God all day. Didn't we read that this morning? There's so many praises that we, in so many ways that we can praise God that, that, that we can avoid sin. There's too many options to praising God. And we do more complaining than praising. And God, like, hold on. You, every time you complain, you're saying to God, you never loved me. Where have you loved me? Every complaint, you know, to doubt God is sin, right? That's complaining. When we allow our, emotion, our emotions to take control over us and, and tell us that this is what this situation is going to be all of the time. That's no. God says no. Whatsoever things are what? Just. Whatsoever things are what? Pure. Whatsoever things are what? Honest. Holy. If there be any report, think on these things. My emotions don't make me. It's fact over feeling. The fact is that God has, has done, he's trying to do something in my life. He's trying to change my life. He's trying to reproduce his character in his church. And this is why the word is of the Lord is so heavy. If it wasn't so heavy, he would have already come by now. We would already be home. They despise God's name and what they did. It is evident that these understood not the meaning of sacrifices as the shadow forth of unblemished, the unblemished lamb of God. They, 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 they wrestled with themselves, thinking that all thrown away which did not turn to their profit, it was a waste of time. If we worship God ignorantly and without understanding, we bring a blind sacrifice. I say that again, y'all. If we worship God ignorantly without understanding, we bring the blind sacrifice. It's almost like I got 50 sheep and God said, I need one that's without spot, without blemish. 
I'm going to go and get a lamb that's blind and take it to God. <laughs> so you mean to tell me all week I've, I don't study the word. I'm just scratching the surface. You know, surface readers give you a surface lifestyle, right? That's what they do. They just scratching the surface. Really, they're not. They're ignorant. They're the blind leading the blind. He like, you're going to bring, you're going to walk through a God face door and bring a blind sacrifice in there and sit here as if everything is okay. That's a blind sacrifice, y'all. Make it more plain and more clear. Romans 12 says, present your bodies as what? A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is all what? Reasonable service. He said, if we do it carelessly, if we are cold, dull, and dead in it, we bring the sick. How am I walking through life dull, cold-hearted? I'm a sick person walking. I'm contaminated. Then you wonder why all of these diseases is hitting me because I've allowed my mind to be affected by everything else that's been going around me. So when I come sit in the presence of God, I'm asking for somebody to pray for me. God like, man, you bringing a sick offering up in here. It's going to be hard to burn this on the altar. If we rest in the bodily exercise and do not make hard work of it, we bring the lame. How many lame men are walking today? How many lame men are walking today? Our constant mercies from God make worse the, the slothfulness and the, I like how they put this word, neglectedness in our returns of duty to God. A spiritual worship shall be established. Our incense shall be offered to God's name, which signifies prayer and praise. God wants, when we put ourselves on the altar, this comes from prayer and praise, y'all. Let's get back to praying and praising God. I know this ain't an easy message to listen to, but getting your temple ready ain't easy either. This is why you need the divine nature. You need something supernatural. And you ask, where have you robbed me? Well, you robbed me because you're still unconvicted of sin. You robbed me because you're still unconvicted of sin. That's where you robbed me. You mean to tell me I gifted you with time, talent, and, and, and all of these things, and you're going to ask me where did I love you? It ain't my fault you didn't use what I gave you. You can't go before God and say, oh, Lord, this, the devil made me do it. <laughs> it's the devil, Lord. You know, he, he caused a lot, of, a lot of things to go. <laughs> you know how we make that excuse? I think my daughter, we was having a little story one night, <laughs> and she made that excuse talking about the devil made her do it. I said, well, I'll tell you this. If I hit you right now and I say the devil made me do it, she was like, no, <laughs> devil didn't make you do that. <laughs> you can't use the devil as an excuse to not use what God has blessed you with. You can't use the devil as an excuse to not be temple ready. God wants your mind, body, and soul. You know, you can't have one without the other, right? If your soul is contaminated, that means your mind and your body is headed for destruction. It's a, you can work out all day. You can be physically fit. That may hold you for a little while. But if your soul and mind is contaminated, you gone, brother. Eventually, you're going to tap out. God wants our mind. Where has a man robbed me? You robbed me in tithe and offering, brother. You took away from me. Notice what God wants to do in widow. It says, in knowledge of God, all true knowledge and the development, we have their source. So wherever we turn, in the physical, in the mental, or in the spiritual realm, and whatever we behold apart from the blight of sin, this knowledge will be revealed. And whatever line of investigation we pursue, 
with a sincere purpose to arrive at truth, we are brought in touch with the unseen, the mighty intelligence that is working and 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 through all. So the mind of harmony and the mind of humanity is the mind, the body, and the soul. This is beyond our estimate. God wants to use us. He needs temples that are ready. Paul put it this way, but God hath revealed unto them by us, by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. This is what the spirit does. Paul says the inner man, when you tap into, into the source, you start searching the deep things of the spirit of God. And when you sit in the class of Christ, God will start unfolding in you mysteries of this gospel, y'all. Mysteries that the mind can't even fathom. His message to humanity, the method that is outlined in these words, was the method followed in the education of the father of our first race. When in his glory of his sinless state of manhood, Adam stood in Eden as a holy person. He was so in tune with God. God said, Adam, here go all of the animals. Name them. You know he had, he had to have a mind like God because he said, pig. And God was like, I would have said that too. Koala. That's exactly what that is. Think of that, like God brought them all, the, and Adam, Adam was so mind, body, and soul. He was so into, like, think of where God is trying to re, he's trying to recreate that same, he's trying to get us back where Adam lost. What is it to have a mind like God? If the spirit can search the deep things of God, that means we got to go into realms with God that, that we haven't even tapped into yet. God trying to take our temple somewhere. You think I'm going to elevate you up in space and you ain't ready? You got folks trying to go to Mars. They think they're going to get there. We're going to get to Mars uh, 2025, y'all. The NASA has developed a system that works. And every time a, a spaceship goes up, what happens? Boom, it blows up. If Satan can't leave this place, how in the world you think you finna take sin somewhere else? The next time we get up out of this place, it's going to be God transformed. The mind has to already be renewed, y'all. You think this incorruption going to put on, this, this corruption going to put on incorruption just in the twinkling of an eye? You got individuals think that, oh, man, I, I'm going to stop drinking. It. I'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. I'm going to be good. It's not that easy. Don't be bamboozled. Paul put it this way, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul said, man, that my members, they are warring against the law in my mind. God has written, he written the law in our hearts. What are my members? My mouth. What did Malachi say? He said, you defame my name. Why are you using such of a conversation that's downplaying the brethren of Christ? Why are you using your hands to touch the unclean thing? Why are you using your feet to go in, un, un, in the appearance of evil? Why am I using my heart to beat for individuals who, who I think I'm in love with that don't even love me? They just using me. He said, it's another law in my members, and it's warring against the law in my mind. It's the, I, can't, I can't use an excuse to say, oh, my, my sin is, my flesh is sinful. You know, my, my flesh, it was the flesh, Lord. No, it wasn't. You was born with that. <laughs> you was born with that. That was given to you by your dad. You were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. So you can't use the flesh as an excuse. It's the will of the man 
that it was you taking the will that God gave you to use the motive that prompts you to do what you wanted to do. The body can't be partaking in sin unless you choose to do it. This is why he said, there's a law in my memories that's warring against the law of my mind. But if I bring it into captivity to the will of God, the law can show me what the enemy is trying to do. Hold on, God, that, that ain't true. Put the Ten Commandments up against everything. I guarantee you, you will start to see the world in a different view. This is the covenant that I will make with Israel. This is the covenant that I will make with Agape. With them after those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. God has written it. To, so even if a man say, I don't even believe in God, you still got to discern between good and evil, bro. You ain't got to believe in it. You, still, you got two options still. <laughs> what you going to do with it? I stop. I don't argue with people who say they don't believe in God. You don't have to. You ain't got to at all. But at the end of the day, when you stand before God, he got questions for you that you didn't have questions to ask. That's why it's important to ask questions. Most of us have too many emotional baggage, and we need to learn to let it go. We need to, we need to declutter our subconscious and get rid of the negative emotions, which are preventing us from enjoying a life of fullness. Let those negative emotions go. Stop operating in your emotional state. I felt like that. Well, yeah, feelings come and go. I'm not saying they don't matter, but they shouldn't dictate over principle. Can't come in the church. Well, she said something. Well, that's cool. That was that day. That's not tomorrow. Tomorrow, a new day. Call her up. We got to get out of that. Get it out of your subconscious. And I guarantee you, the Bible says, happy is he who keepeth the law. You will have, listen, you don't even have to abide by the health message. If you keep the Ten Commandments, you can live a long life. God said, happy is he. A happy person lives a long time, y'all. Because he got a peace of mind. He's comfortable in who he is or who she is. The fact is, your subconscious is already programmed to help you deal with life. Your subconscious ensures you don't accidentally forget to breathe. It keeps your heart beating. It regulates your body's temperature and millions of other things. It doesn't need additional beliefs to function well. Your subconscious already knows, hey, my heart is beating. <laughs> so what we do, we add to that. Oh, I'm feeling this way. So now you put more pressure on the heart. Now you're having a heart attack. Because you felt some type of way in your subconscious, and now you, you, just, you just hospitalized yourself because of how you felt. Don't let your emotions become a disease that can, that can contaminate your mind and put you in a critical condition. Neither does it need your, neither does your, your subconscious need you to store emotions. If you are like most people, you spend the majority of your time living in your head. Stop living in your head. Oh, man, what, what, what am I going to do today? What am I? Stop living in your head. Listen, God says don't worry about this stuff, man. The lily of the field don't worry. He neither spins nor toils, but he praises me. He said he's, he's arrayed better than Solomon in all of his glory. Why? Because the lily understands something. Through Christ I'm growing, y'all. I don't have to spin and toil and twist and turn. You know, when your emotions, that's what your emotions do. They just turning you in all types of ways. James said you are like the waves of the sea. You're tossed to and fro. Stop letting your emotions dictate who you are. Your emotions don't make you. You have control over those things. And God has given you ample ability and power to do so. To start letting go of your emotions, you must first become aware 
of them by becoming more in touch with their body and the ways in which he feels. You can feel any type of way, but when the spirit of God is dwelling in you, that trumps feeling, y'all. When the spirit of God is living in you, that trumps how you feel. I'm about to wrap this thing up. Listen to 2 Peter 1, 4. Partakers of God's nature. The Lord created man out of the dust of the earth. He made Adam a partaker of his life, his nature. There was God breathed into him the breath of the Almighty, and he became a living soul. Adam was strong. He was comely. He was pure. He was bearing the image of his maker. Adam was one with the divine nature of God both emotionally, physically, spiritually, and mentally. I challenge you all, Agape. This is one thing I love about boxing. It's because after you get into a fight, you can always go back and re-look at the footage. As you go throughout this next week that's coming up, Right before, the, guard the edges of the Sabbath. While you guard the edges, just sit down and reflect on your whole week on uh, how you had the opportunity to make certain moves. Just re, re, revisit the footage of yourself. And I guarantee you, you're going to start to see certain things that you knew you could have did, that you should have did, but things that you had the chance to do that you could have did, but some of us, we, we, some things that we wanted to do and we did do, but reevaluating the footage, it helps us out a whole lot because I'm able to see exactly what the enemy got me with so that he don't do it a second time. Revisit your tape. Reevaluate yourself. And even in the spur of the moment, start to get out of your head and just say you know what Lord have your way with me Malachi's message was, was, was to the Israelites return back to God and he will return back to you that's a message of hope I challenge you all we just, just return back to God this ain't about your money cause the person that ain't got no job what are you gonna bring into the house of worship itself. It's about the person. God's concerned about the person. He wants you. He wants you. Listen to what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 14. He says, always bearing about in the body, dying to the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in my body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in me. I want Jesus manifested in me. And the more and more I talk to God, the more and more I want him, I want to be close. I want to be sardine. I want to be in that can. Squeeze tight to him. You know how tight sardines is in the can, right, Swan? They close. <laughs> That's how close you should want to be with God. I don't know about you, but this whole week, God, the enemy been on one, but at the same time, I cried out to the Lord, and he heard my cry, y'all. I said, Lord, I want to be close to you. That's no other place. God said, all you got to do is return to me. That's it. That's not hard. If you return to me, I'm going to return to you. How many of us are willing to return to God in all that we do? That he could be manifested in our character. Maybe there's somebody today that's saying, you know what? I rob, I've been robbing you this whole time, God. And this ain't even been about money. 
It's been about my personal self, my, my, myself. And what I, what I thought I was going through was a little bit more severe. Maybe there's somebody today that's like, you know, I've been robbing you, God, for, for in just small matters. God, like, return to me. Return back to me. If that's you, stand on your feet. If you feel you robbed God, stand on your feet. I'm already standing. Because <laughs> at some point in our life, all of us has robbed God. I don't want to be the one, like Christ said, as it was in the day of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. If individuals had the windows of heaven open and they, and they couldn't receive the blessings, but the blessings were the blessings that wiped them out, I don't want to be an individual who has the blessings of God to wipe me out when I have every ounce of opportunity to receive the blessing and inherit it. I don't want to be the Esau. I want to be the Jacob. I'm going to give an extra extension to someone that's maybe contemplating following Christ. Maybe you, you've heard this message and you're like, yo, I... I can't figure out where I've robbed you, Lord. Help me to really see myself and where I've been robbing you. And even at this point, you want to make a decision to say, you know what, even though I did rob you, Father, help me to come back to you today. If there's a person in this room that feels that they need to come back to Jesus today, come forth. Come forth. God is calling you. And as I stand between the dead and the living, I'm pleading along with Christ to extend the in invitation from Jesus that you will come for. God says, return to me, and I will return to you. Let us pray, family. Father in heaven. Father, we just want to thank you for just your, your loving kindness, your tender mercy towards us, Father. But Father, you are so gracious and long-suffering and angry that you were along with us, Father. Father, if, 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 if you're asking that we return to you, you're giving the invitation to return to us, that's a promise, Lord. You said all we have to do is turn back to you you've already given your word that you would do so. So I'm praying, Father, in every instance of each and every one of our lives, Father, that you will allow us to return back to you wholeheartedly. As David says, purge us with his sin, Father. Cleanse us. Wash us. Blot out our iniquities, Lord. Don't allow our iniquities to be counted against us, for who will be able to stand? But we thank you for being continuously and gracious in your mercy. For if it had not been for mercy, Father, where would we be? We would be in a tomb, six feet, lost. But you've given us a second opportunity to get closer to you. So I pray with every ounce of strength, every will, ounce of willpower that we have that is within us, that you would allow us to come and return back to you. That you will return back to us as a God. Keep us as a family, Father. Bless, continue to bless us as a family. But don't allow us to overlook the blessings and be lost by the blessings. Help us to inherit those blessings that we can save somebody else inside of the blessings. Keep us, oh Lord. Keep us. In Jesus almighty and precious name, we pray and we ask you. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Continue to be blessed.